So one of the things uh, that I do in developing content and kind of thinking about topics is talk and talk and talk to lots of different people. And so uh, Jack Young and I were uh, actually talking about, you know, we've, we've done like trends in funding, we've done all these interesting things, you know, topics over the years, you know, what's available out there for funding, all that, all that, you know, typical, typical stuff. But um, one of the things he was telling me this year is there's all of this incredible, you know, accelerator incubation funding out there, and uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff coming out of it, but there's this chasm of, of lack of, of funding and nurturing that they come out of the accelerators, they come out of these incubators, and there's this lack, there's this, this hole, and they have to get over it before someone like a Qualcomm or a Kleiner Perkins or, you know, whoever would, would fund them, and they have to show significant traction before, the, you know, I want to call it the, the big guns come in. So um, I think that uh, it, it was a really interesting kind of topic, and hopefully we'll be able to kind of debate what, what are we going to do to help the these, um, these companies that have potentially so much potential get through this, this middle part. And so um, Jack, I think, is actually backstage right now loading up. Um, he's got a really cool, cool story to share with you um, um, uh, about his red eye back from New York. So um, anyway, I want to introduce David Shewitz, who's going to moderate this debate slash discussion. And Jack will be out here momentarily. He's going to get mic'd and have a screenshot for a screen for you guys. Cool. All Great right. Well, uh, thanks for joining us. This is so. I'm David Shewitz. I'm the uh, chief medical officer of uh, DNA Nexus. So I think I know a bunch of you in a bunch of different contexts. Um, I'm joined here uh, today by uh, Mark at uh, Launchpad Digital, by uh, Lynn uh, at Kleiner, uh, and then uh, Jack, who um, I always know as being at Qualcomm, but now he's at um, uh, DRX Capital, and he's going to tell us about that. He had a, as he'll, I won't break the surprise, we had a great day yesterday, which we'll share with you. Um, so one of the, uh, the, the, this is supposed to be a focused panel that's really trying to talk about one of the key inflection points in company growth. What's exciting is that it, we, Digital health has advanced to the point where these conversations matter. Uh, and so the real question is, once there's an initial sort of an idea for a company, what's the sort of the, uh, what is the trajectory for a company uh, growing from sort of an idea to initial funding to getting more substantial funding? How do you go beyond that? Where are the key inflection points? And then almost as important, I think, in today's, in today's world, where there seems to be this giant pool of money that's floating around uh, looking yeah, maybe some, some people are saying, well, I wish I saw that. But, um, you know, we're, there were, in some sense, as you, anyone who watches Silicon Valley probably saw, you know, <laughs> it's, as much of a, it's as much of an issue taking too much money in some cases before one's ready as, uh, not, ha as not taking any. So it's always better to have money to take, but how you actually use it and apply it and, put to get, and really use it wisely is really going to be the focus of this discussion. So I wanted to start with, um, uh, with uh, Lynn. Um, just to sort of get a sense of both where, where Kleiner is in the, um, you know, how, because they, they, they've, you know, this traditional, Kleiner has been, a, you know, one of the longest, oldest involved, uh, firms involved in um, uh, life sciences. You may have seen the, the uh, you know, Byers Lecture Hall next door, testament to their success in this area. Um, and then, um, but recently they've really been very involved in digital health. Um, they've been um, uh, uh, a strong supporter of rock health, uh, which I'm particularly happy to see. Um, and then they, they've recruited such talent as Lynn to be able to really play a really key role in, um, in evolving the program. So I'd love to understand both where Kleiner is and specifically where you see the sort of the key inflection points of early company growth. Great. Well, thank you for having me. Really appreciate being here and seeing a lot of familiar faces in the crowd. Um, at Kleiner, I think, you know, we have a very long history of investing both in what I'll call the digital side of the house and not to be kind of black and white about things, but I think it helps in terms of frameworks of thinking, but in terms of the digital side of the house, so if that's consumer tech as well as enterprise software, um, we've been very active in that space for a very long period of time, but we've also been very active in what I'd call some of the traditional healthcare venture areas such as med device, therapeutics, diagnostics, and also, of course, digital health. So I think we have a very unique perspective in being able to bring both of these worlds together as we see this inflection point of digital health as a sector overall. And so we have, we manage four funds. Two, I think, are really applicable to what we're talking about today. 
One is an early stage fund, our traditional uh, early stage Series A fund. It's a $450 million fund that's diversified. And then we also have a digital growth fund, which is a $750 million fund that looks at late stage. So some of our investments, such as Practice Fusion, Teladoc, came out of the late stage fund. So we can invest early and late. And I think the important part of how we see this is that we are a diversified fund. So when I say that, every dollar that we invest goes against the next WhatsApp idea or, or otherwise. And so we have a very high bar for what every venture that we invest in, be it digital health, be it consumer, be it enterprise software. And so I think hopefully that gives you kind of wind in terms of where we think this industry will be going and what we can achieve in digital so, health. So on the early stage, the one, the fund that's devoted to really sort of the early stage stuff, I assume that's inspired by some of the, you know, the stuff you see coming out of Rock Health. Where do you see as the sweet spot or where, where do you feel like the companies sort of most need your assistance? Where are you trying to come in on? What, what level? Yeah, so we typically uh, invest in Series A. That is where most a majority of our investments are. Like I said, we also have a digital growth fund, and we've done quite a few digital health investments out of that. Um, in our sweet spot, I would say that typically we find um, a group of founders. The team is really important. Um, it always is, no matter what stage you're in. But I think very much so in a Series A, where business models change over time, and especially because we have such a fluid environment of what's happening in healthcare, where we're all making hypotheses upon hypotheses of how this will all develop. Having an incredibly strong team that can take those reins, be agile, um, is really important, and we help build in that team. So, you know, again, I'm going to be a bit black and white, and there's always gray in the middle here. <laughs> But sometimes we see what I call a digital health investor, or I said, apologize, entrepreneur come in, and they really understand consumer engagement or gaming or otherwise. We have a founder like that, which is Jason Oberfest of Mango. Um, or we see a healthcare uh, experience executive who's looking at a new uh, digital health company. And so we find that we like the blend of these teams and to build that blend over time, so we help in terms of team building. Um, another big area I really think is business model. And you know, typically in consumer tech, because there's no true cost uh, to have channel uh, penetration, that's very different in healthcare. So you really have to think about business models, and I'm sure we'll talk about that more here. But that's something where I think we help try to accelerate and evolve that thinking. So let me work Mark into this. So Mark is a, a very sort of experienced operator and um, uh, an entrepreneur. And um, uh, I know a lot of his thinking is exactly along the lines of what Lynn was describing is what's the optimal founder team and how do you sort of put them together and what are some of the pitfalls? Yeah, well, uh, thank you. And, uh, and thank you all and thank you, Jill, for thinking of inviting me to, uh, to this panel discussion. It's an honor. Um, so at Launchpad Digital Health, we've made 11 seed stage investments uh, in digital health, and we define it fairly broadly so that we may, we may catch a number of different companies that might fall outside of some folks' perhaps narrower set of parameters around digital health. And, um, and since, just since October, uh, I've logged in at our firm uh, 600 different companies that we've seen. So there's an enormous amount of activity within digital health. And describe the model today. where people, you incubate people for a year within your walls. Yeah, so, so we sort of view ourselves as a, as a throwback uh, venture fund and, and, and something that, that uh, Kleiner does as well in terms of looking at early seed stage, uh, but having an operational, uh, having operational input. And, and that's exactly what we do. So, so typically the team is uh, a medical doctor and, and a chief technology officer type, whether that person has ever been a CTO or not. Do they know each other before you met them? They, they, they know each other, and they've been in business for between a year to so two and a half years. So you're not like one years. of these founder dating people. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, not, so the, these companies typically have revenue by the time they come to us. Uh, so they've proven out their business model to a certain extent, oftentimes limited, but to a certain extent they've, they've uh, shown a market fit for their product or service. And, and typically, as I said, it's that, that marriage of a, of a medical doctor and a chief technology officer. Um, what is often missing is 
exactly what Lynn alluded to, and it's a little bit more of that, um, whether it be business development or sales or marketing, but that, that business adult in the room. And uh, so we spent a lot of time with our companies in their organizational chart and determining where there are gaps, where they need to be filled, and over what period of time. Uh, so when we, when we fund these companies, we like to see them have uh, a runway of operations for 15 to 18 months. And since they are with us for a year, as you said, uh, that means that they can keep their head down and grow their company while they're with us. Do you feel like they sh the companies should be, are not doing something sort of at an earlier stage that they should be, or at an earlier stage, is it you're just trying to figure out even what you have, and then it's appropriate at the stage where they sort of meet you to then really solidify their business model? Uh, I, I would say it varies. Right? That's the obvious yeah. answer, perhaps. But uh, uh, if, if there's anything that I can sort of generalize about, it is um, between the doctor and the chief technology officer, uh, a reluctance to put a real sales force behind the product that they have. Huh. And again, overgeneralizing, over but uh, the, the doctor uh, side of that often has great connections into hospital groups and into uh, other, other doctor groups and associations and, and has a belief or may have a belief that that in and of itself is enough to get in front of the right folks. Whereas the technical person uh, may believe that the technology will sell itself. Right. And really neither is the case in and of itself. You need that sales and marketing side. You need that, that business person. So there really is sort of like this third component that, um, do you think that, I guess, over time, if you have seasoned entrepreneurs, they start to appreciate that and build that in from an earlier point? I mean, I think of like Doc Simity's growth with, sure. like with Jeff Tagany, where, you know, the, the sort of um, LinkedIn for doctors, more or less. And because of his experience, um, uh, you know, with, with, with previous operations, it seemed to me like just from an outsider, he was able to hit the ground running and really recognize that need, the need for that in a way that's, you know, maybe some more naive people wouldn't. Well, so digital health, mobile health, we're talking software, right, right. for the most part, yeah, at least in our business, yeah. and enterprise-facing software, again, for the most part in our business. And so there's a balance you need to, to bridge between adding more developers to enhance the product you have and bring out the next generation of the product versus adding more sales and marketing support to go and sell what you have. And then I think people like Steve Blank would say that, although I can imagine some, particularly some physicians in the audience, might be listening to this and saying, oh my gosh, it's sales and marketing. This is sort of the part of medicine or the part of business or medical entrepreneurship that we don't like. People like Steve, like Steve Blank, who's sort of an author of Lean Startup, spends a lot of time talking about the role of the, 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 the essential, that getting out, of the, getting out of the building and going out and talking to your customers is an underappreciated aspect of translational research. And he's actually go out, out there talking to the NIH and their i trying to actually inculcate this sense of going and talking to the customers and understanding that your idea of what the problem is may be different than what they have. And what you're saying is it's even nicer when you have sort of a professional organization within your company that's doing this. Um, let me introduce um, uh, Jack, who's uh, looking at my guys. I had a bunch of nights on call, and I've never looked like as alert <laughs> post a red eye, so that's pretty impressive. So Jack, uh, Two hours. <laughs> Jack has come back from um, um, a day in New York yesterday, which he'll tell about. He's a general partner at DRX Capital. Um, so uh, what were you up to yesterday? Yeah, um, so I would say yesterday, it's, uh, I would have considered that's a landmark day for digital health. So finally, we have a company went public, and the market received very well and continues to receive well. So I actually prepared a few, uh, I took a few pictures, so I want to share the excitement, if I may. Let's go, uh, can we roll them? the deck? So it's the first trading day on uh, Fitbit on Wall Street. So early in the morning at uh, 8 Eight o'clock in the morning. Uh, next slide, please. Is that a clicker? I can. Miss. Yeah. So here's uh, James. Uh, so some of you know. Very excited. Arrived in uh, Wall Street. I couldn't believe that we went to the New York Exchange, and this is what we see. The entire building is wrapped with Fitbit, and it's a very subtle. It's a very subtle, you see, but. Uh, <laughs> This line here, it's the Fitbit up symbol, right? It's, so for those of you who know the Fitbit symbol here, this is very subtle, but we, we, but we all caught it. And James certainly, you know, like a little kid today, I guess to say. And uh, as we progress into the second floor and go into the trading floor, once you, you know, clear the clearance, and here's the trader, holds a sign. He was right at the entrance, he goes, and he did Fitbit. It's, it's funny, you know. 
And uh, you probably saw this Fitbit is a category defining uh, devices now. The new words is the kit. Uh, Fitbit is the new clinic uh, clinics, so it's good for everybody. Uh, what's happening here? Wow, this is get cut off. But this is basically a picture I was going to show everybody gets on the uh, the podium, and we waited and waited. Actually, you know, the market opens at nine thirty. How many people been onto the floor? I want to see. There's quite a few, so you know the excitement there. That you waited and waited, and finally, you can imagine today with all the technology will be instantaneous. But the market was at 9:30, and I don't know if you see the clock here. We all waited like all oh, good 28 minutes, and with the traders are like talking to each other and all the all the fuzz is going on. And finally, boom, it opens, open up, 31 dollars, right? So, so if you recall, if you follow that IPO, it's starting to price at 14 to 16, then it was raised to 16 to 19. The night before was priced at 20, so boom, right there. It's a 50% appreciation uh, in day one. And the amount of shares that were offered were also increased, right? What's that? The amount of shares that were offered were also upside. That's right. Yeah, it was. It was. Uh, it was. Uh, you know, it was 39 million shares, and I was told that yesterday was the Fitbit was the fifth, fifth highest traded first day trading uh, this year, right? So the significance here is that here's a digital company, digital health company. At do, on the track doing over a billion dollar revenue and very profitable and as a result the market received very well six billion dollars right so some of you probably heard me talking some times ago I had a, this funny math that four billion dollars went to venture capital how much money is going to come back uh, one day I'll show you that chart I was pretty skeptical whether we're going to get all the money back but here it is six <laughs> billion dollars um, oh gee it's not working out here is so I, again on the trading floor was Kramer uh, it was a picture here that was, he was talking, so he goes, bye, 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 and uh, he thinks 31 is cheap, $38, but that's Kramer, not me, <laughs> saying I can't be responsible. <laughs> oh, the picture's not showing up. Oh, no. It was, there was basically a big uh, 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 flex, and then, uh, uh, this is too bad. It's not showing up um, with all the excitement. So anyway, so right after that, we went out to the market to the um, on the Wall Street. There was a big mat set up. Everybody was doing their push-ups. Was led by one of the actresses. <laughs> uh, that's too bad. It's not showing up. Well, ah, okay. So anyway, so there was a picture of James and myself, and I was making James is obviously a six hundred million dollar man now and I was his agent. Here we go. So the last picture shows up. Uh, so I posted it on Facebook. I got 85 likes and uh, that's more than anything I got for my birthday. <laughs> yeah. So if you have Facebook friends with me and like it. Anyway, so that's it. Alright, well, that's very <laughs> so, um, so um, I want to ask about um, some a question about is it you know, an exciting new fund, but I, I can't resist asking a Fitbit, I don't know if this is on Okay. Um, so the, the, the question is, so here you go, you have this huge opening, everyone's excited about Fitbit. And then I kind of go back about um, half an hour to Roy's talk, where he's talking about the importance of measuring outcome versus fee-for-service, and, and yeah. you know, I look at it, and at the end of the day, how is Fitbit not a tchotchke? That's my question. Is this now what? How, how, how is it just not like some little gadget or gizmo, um, yeah. and how is it improving outcomes, or well, does that not matter? So the way I looked at it, uh, the digital health is the ecosystem, right? So uh, I've talked to a couple times. Uh, the, You're the going to fill out Lisa Sunin's chart here pretty soon, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so basically the way I looked at it, it was if you look at it, all the connected devices, wearables and IOTs, and Fitbit in included, that's basically the first stage, right? So. There's no digital health unless we have data, right? And we need new data, not the EMR data and the static data. We need the real-time data to make a, a meaningful real-time impact. So that's the beginning. So Fitbit is a necessity to enable digital health. In fact, in my definition of digital health, actually probably slightly different from yours, it's not just the software. My definition of digital health always involves with usage of these devices, IOTs, wearables, and you know, obviously cell phone uh, application generated data, that's a key of it. So the way I looked at a Fitbit is basically give you a one dimensional, right? And in fact, in Fitbit is giving you multiple now that the heart rate and they'll continue to work on sensors. And then what happened is that string of data need to be combined with other data we already have, the EMR, genomics, and all the data. 
and then you can derive, derive insight. And once that insight is derived, what happens is actually will give a feedback. So if you were to be wearing, wearing a wristband or you know, watch, mm -hmm. that data, your activity data combined with all the other data, so that will give you some kind of feedback. Or well, the feedback goes to your caretakers, your doctor, so it creates a behavior change. So to me, those things are all working together. You cannot just isolate them, isolate them and uh, look at the single components, because we all work together as an ecosystem. Right, right. Um, now, sorry, one other question, and again, maybe this even bit of information came from Bob Wachter's wonderful book, which, by the way, everyone should buy and should read. He, he actually was underselling it, believe it or not. It was a really amazing book. Um, the, um, uh, the, how long do people typically wear these devices before it winds up in their drawer or lost? Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, statistically, I, I mean, I read it everywhere. I'm not, you know, I don't think it's Fitbit disclosed that number, but... Right. Um, but I mean, I, I, you, you hear that, the, that yeah, most people, yeah. you know, are very excited about it for two months, one month, or something like that. Sure enough, sure yeah. enough, yeah. So that's definitely a, a, a problematic for many of those wearables, and Fitbit is certainly doing much better than that. And one of the things I mentioned about is how do you engage, how do you get feedback, right? right. So Fitbit always took a temp. I bought a company called Fitstar just before IPO, so the idea is to provide the elements of a, a personal coaching. And to me, actually, Lane, you touched it early on. There's lots of components to get people engaged. Like, I'm type A, so numbers work for me, right? <laughs> Pie charts, numbers, I love yeah. that kind of stuff, tweets. But other people uh, respond to other things, right? Maybe the social, maybe gamification we talked about, right? How do people respond to that? The, the people respond very well to you know, social pressure, right? And uh, you know, there's a company you probably heard about, Omada, using that techniques to engage people to prevent. Understand um, what, by, what, what you've been involved with. So you, that, that involvement, so they, uh, Qualcomm was a D round investor, right, as I recall, uh, 2013 um, in um, um, uh, Fitbit. Yes. Um, but then more recently, tell us about this, both about the new um, uh, fund that you've started, Digital Health yeah. Fund with yeah. Novartis, yeah. and how that's trying to help. Um, Entrep digital health entrepreneurs get across this funding. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, so just a quick <clears throat> cap. Of, the Qualcomm Life Fund was introduced in 2011. We was, you know, earmarked to invest in digital health companies. So this week, we have a big week. We had an announcement of our latest investment in a company called Doctown Demand. So clearly, this is as close gets to. I hate to use the word Uber, but this is as close as gets Uber yeah. for doctor as gets, right? So Doctown Demand, our latest and greatest. With Benrock, right? Yeah, yes, the correct. Yeah, Bob and Pope, Tenera. Pope, Pope, yeah, which is really interesting. And uh, so, so if you look at the first investment, we like it's it's in a very early stage, right? So we look at the all four corners of the healthcare provider pairs and etc. And when Nevada's coming to working with Qualcomm last year, we soon realized pharmaceutical companies are under the exactly the same pressure, and they want to leverage the digital te technology as well. So we come together, quickly converge down. There is an area, potentially, it's a specialty within digital health, what we call digital medicine. So the definition of digital medicine, which is different from a, a digital health, which can encompass wellness and fitness, all the things that digital medicine requires to demonstrate evidence, right? So why this thing, how it works, has to go through the same rigorous uh, process to demonstrate that, and more important to that, I find a way to pay by the healthcare provider, whether it's paid directly by, subsidized by farmer or paid by the payer. So that elevates to that into a different level. So there are lots of companies out there who already done that, right? I mentioned about Omada is based on the, a very well established uh, protocol, and there's company out there, WellDoc. Uh, so we are very pleased that DRX Capital was launched in, 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 in January. We actually, so significant, now we have an ad on the third <laughs> page, uh, my colleague, Caroline is right there in the red. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, I mean, it's almost funny that you sort of need to differentiate between, you know, di you know evidence-based health or health because, you know, you'd like to think that they were a little bit synonymous. Um, to what extent, so Kleiner is, a, is an example of a company that, that has incredibly rich experience, probably in many ways you can interpret that term, 
um, with life science companies, with pharma. Do you see pharma taking digital health seriously yet? Are they still kicking the tires, or are they looking at it more seriously? Because that's going to have implications for entrepreneurs who are thinking about their business models. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we look at all the sectors. And I mean, I think something that's really important that I think Jack is touching on is that we talk about digital health as a sector, but truly, there are so many subsectors with which to invest it underneath that, that definition. And each sector, I think you need to treat differently. And so you, you're pointing out life science. I mean, we absolutely see they are at the nexus of innovation of you know, products, typically. But you'll start to see life science. And I'll put med device, biotech, diagnostics within that category, pharma. Um, as really trying to evolve their models, not just from products, so if it's a drug or if it's a med device, but truly wrapping around services to include a more holistic experience and really to provide solution sets overall. So you see Medtronic making some really big gains into the space, um, Sanofi as well. Um, so I think that's one holistic thing that as we think about life science companies, we have a couple companies where life science is their main customer, so Zephyr Health, which is a big data analytics platform with nine applications for sales, marketing, med affairs, clinical, their whole business is selling to life science companies because as Jack talks about, the data is coming from everywhere. If it's a clinical trial that you're running with devices and you're getting data from the individual, if it's EHR, if it's your clinical trials itself, melding that together, making it useful. And truly, you know, when we say big data, we actually really like to talk about smart data. Big data can be overwhelming, and data into itself is not a solution. It's how do you make smart data for the business users to be able to use in their strategy and execution. And I think that's where another trend that you'll see is what I call, instead of horizontal apps, like if we think in an enterprise software framework, really towards verticalized solutions, and that's where Zephyr comes in. They're, they are laser-like focused on the life science, and we've probably seen some predicates in the space, such as Viva, uh, which really took a Salesforce.com horizontal platform, created a verticalized solution for life sciences, and is now a $3 billion company um, that went IPO in 2013. Right. So because one of the premises we believe in is that life sciences is different, healthcare is different, and therefore horizontal applications and software will not do the trick, will not provide that value, and we need specific verticalized solutions so, across the stack. So, so, what, so here's a question, it's probably unfair to dump it onto you, but what, you know, there's a lot, one of the things that comes out of Rock Health a lot is everyone's excited by the idea of ACOs. We heard the wonderful kind of keynote talk today that says in the future everything is going to be an ACO. On the other hand, if you look around, we're not there yet. And, solu and there have been so many solutions that have, you know, clever entrepreneurs have proposed that would make sense in an ACO world that don't seem viable at, at present. What, how do you advise uh, you know, young entrepreneurs who are coming up with these, you know, do you, you know, where do you, is that an opportunity to sort of the, the you know, sort of value-based care, or are they going to be counting on it, are they going to be counting on something that's more promised than reality? Do you, have, do you advise them in terms of the evolution of that? Because that seemed to be one of the top topics that I felt was coming most out of, at least on the earlier days of Rock Health. We do, but I think, uh, as, as Jack and Lynn both said, our, our portfolio tends to, to be fairly broad and not reliant on one vertical, if you will, for revenue. So then, then in terms of different verticals, I mean, the two that I, often everyone thinks of are pharma and then um, uh, like large employers. Those seem to always be where everyone either immediately or shortly winds up. Are there other sort of, uh, no? Not yeah, I mean, I, well, I just want to add to your ACO comment and something we haven't talked about, and Jack is right, and I've always believed that this is a defining year for digital health, is the Evelyn IPO. And that absolutely goes towards that model, is a provider-centric solution mm -hmm. um, that I would argue is not just software, it's services as well, and you can see that in their S1 and they are incredibly successful and have reached a billion dollars in market cap value and raising um, you know, a good amount of money. But again, the multiples work. It's, it's, we need to talk about that as well. So between Evelyn, Fitbit, um, and we have obviously Teladoc is on file. Yeah. Um, it's an exciting that. time. Let me just give the last like word to Mark. Well, I would just add one other example of that. At the, as the, uh, the proud parent, and one, one of our portfolio companies today announced that they have 
uh, completed a Series A race. Uh, it's a company called Sensely, a virtual nurse, and they use uh, artificial intelligence as the backbone of their uh, intelligence. And, and what they do effectively, and the CEO, Adam Odesky, who's speaking later and maybe maybe here today somewhere, uh, is they, they, uh, they relieve doctors and, and other care providers of sort of the bottom 20, 25% of the tasks that they have to do so that they can focus on the real work of interacting with people. So who are they going to so sell forth. to? Who do they sell? So they sell across the board. They sell to pharma. They sell to med device companies. They sell to insurance companies. Um, they sell to hospital groups. Wow. All right. Well, I mean, we, at least we were able to touch a little bit of the different aspects of the landscape. I'm really appreciative of all of the guests here today and, um, uh, and of uh, Anor and of um, the, um, uh, the Digital Health Summit for inviting us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you all. Thank you.